It's so great to be in church. It's one of the last, um, last Sunday we did things a bit differently and it was great. Uh, for those of us who were here, we were sharing about some of the things that we, we were looking back on with gratitude, but also how we're looking forward with faith. Um, and uh, to, just to let you know it's just a, a, what's coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, we're not going to be starting a message series like we normally would, until, but, we're, but we're not going to start until the end of January, just because uh, next Sunday uh, we've got a great friend of mine coming called Marcus Mosey. Um, Marcus is uh, Pam and um, Dave's, uh, David's uh, pastor over at New Life Church in Lancaster. Um, he's a great friend of mine. I've got to know him really uh, quite a lot over the last, especially over the last few years, um, and leads a church over in Lancaster. And, and Marcus has a Whilst sometimes I think he, he's not always thankful for it, but he has a great ministry across the city uh, in uniting leaders, um, which I know has taken a lot of pain and time and effort um, to get to the point where we're at, where especially as Bible-believing leaders from across Morecambe, Lancaster, and the surrounding areas, we come together regularly at least once a month, and, and Marcus is a, a key figurehead within that, and I'm so glad that Marcus is going to come and bring God's Word to us next Sunday. Also, just to say, they're not here today, but we'll be praying for Ewan and Susie. Ewan and Susie are getting married next Saturday, um, so let's be praying for them um, as well. And then on the 22nd, I've already mentioned it's, it's um, Hope's dedication. Would someone press the green button if possible? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, we've got one of my best friends coming to preach, a guy called Johnny Leach. Uh, he's preached at Hope's dedication. Johnny is the leader at uh, Light and Life at Thornton, which is another free Methodist church over in Thornton. Um, he also happens to be the mayor of Garstang, uh, owns a chip shop um, in Garstang as well. Um, he's, he's one of those gu- crazy guys. He's got this, this crazy capacity, um, but he is yeah, one of my best friends and in life you need some brothers or you need some sisters who are there with you and for you in stuff and Johnny's one of those guys for me and so I'm really excited for the next couple of weeks. And so this week, um, I've had a few days off at the start of the week. Um, I was working Thursday and Friday, and uh, in our few days, we sort of kind of spontaneously decided, um, just before New Year's, why don't we decorate our dining room? Why don't we decorate the conservatory? And so I was there laying on the floor, like glossing uh, the skirting board. Um, and uh, it was fun. Like, to be honest, it looks good, so I'm, I'm all right. Uh, I, don't, I don't mind it too much. It's quite therapeutic uh, in some respects. Um, but I was praying and just thinking about today, knowing that it was going to be a one-off message, um, and just God, what should I bring? What, what is it that's on your heart? Um, and I was reminded of a song that's been played countless times um, over the last sort of five, six months in our house um, called Firm Foundations. We're actually going to sing it um, after the message. Um, and it's called Firm Foundation. And I just sensed God whisper to me, that's your message. Like, Firm Foundation. Firm foundations. Like, what are our foundations? What are our going to be as we step into 2023? And uh, ladies, I'm not asking, like, what's your makeup routine going to look like with your foundations this year or anything like that. As you can tell, I've got mine on. Um, <laughs> but I'm not asking even, like, what are your New Year's resolutions? We looked at some of those goals and some of those things last week, whether you've made one or not. I'm not asking what your life's like on the surface. Like, life can look pretty good sometimes on the surface. But what is your life actually built on? Like, when the storms come, and we know they will, Right? When the storms of life come, what's life looking like? When the relationship challenges come, when there's challenges financially, maybe if you're a business owner in business, things are a bit more challenging than they have been for a while. Maybe it's in your health. Maybe there's been an interesting diagnosis or something that you've longed for hasn't quite happened. Maybe it's to do with your housing and the the shifting of that sort of stuff. In those storms of life, how do you journey through them? How do you weather the storm? And there's a a parable which which Jesus told in in Matthew chapter 7, but he also tells in Luke chapter 6. And let me read it to you. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49, the verses should appear on the screen as well. It says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them, puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. 
But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. In, in the version in Matthew, we read that he's built on sand. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. One of the things I'm so aware of in my life is that it's not simply enough just to read the Bible, re- hear a sermon, sing a few worship songs. Those things are good and they help, of course. But the key has to be whether the rubber's hitting the road, whether we're actually putting the word of God into action. We live in an age where we have more access than ever before to the word of God. And we can binge on it. And if I'm honest, there are far too many obese Christians. Now, I'm not talking about physical weight. Though, this year, I'm going to make myself really accountable here. (laughs) I've set myself a goal of losing 26 kilos. I've already lost 3.4, was it, this week? Something like that. So, yeah. Um, But obese Christians are those who, like I have often done, We read verse after verse, hear sermon after sermon, and it's not made much difference in our lives. We're eating and feeding on God's word, but we're not exercising and putting into practice. And we're coming bloated and fat on God's word, and even now it's making us less active and putting it into practice even less. You will never grow and be healthy as a Christian unless you put legs on your faith. Unless you pull it into action, you will not be healthy as a Christian. You'll never grow and mature and become complete when the storms of life come. It's not just about posting a verse on Facebook or anything like that. It's great if you do that sort of thing. But is it making a real difference in your life? It's about being transformed from the inside out by the Holy Spirit, being obedient to Christ, seeing our words, our actions, our thoughts, our whole lives changed and transformed and conformed to being more like Christ. So Firm Foundation is all about a life built on Jesus, built on his word and following him, which is ultimately all about grace, is only actually possible by grace. And as we do so, we experience his grace. So how can we do this? How can we build firm foundation, build these kinds of lives, foundations that last, foundations that see us through the storms, foundations that enable us to move forward, keep growing, keep maturing, building a life worthy of the calling that God has given us? I want to share with you this morning some of which are called means of grace. Um, You might call them spiritual disciplines as well. But these are things that we can do that enable us to grow in and experience God's grace. Now, please don't hear this as a to-do list, though these are things I want to really encourage you to build into your life. Because I want to encourage, I'm not going to, each one of these could be a sermon in itself on how we build foundations and who knows, maybe it might be, it can become a sermon series at some point. But I want to encourage you, I want to put some tools in your hands to enable you to build good foundations. Because the reality is I can't build your foundations. I can help you, I can, I can, I can give you, hopefully, got a Bible-based, strong messages from the Bible. I can do that. But it's up to you if you put it into practice. It's up to you if you build those foundations. It's up to you if you're going to hear God's word and put it into practice and therefore build those foundations. Or whether you're going to be like the guy who built his house in the sand and who heard the word of God. He was in the right position. He heard the word of God. He had the tools in his hands. just didn't use them. So I want to just, I'm going to, I think there's nine of them. I'm not going to go into much detail on all of them. But I want to just encourage you to start building some of these things. And it's been challenging for me to remind myself afresh of some of these things um, afresh. So first and foremost, and hopefully really obviously, the, found, the, the key to having a good foundation is scripture. Yeah, it should be obvious, right? How, how do we put God's word into action if we don't spend time and if we don't know it? If we're not reading it, meditating, it, studying the scripture, scriptures, listening to sermons, but not just, I want to encourage you, when you hear a sermon, don't just hear it. Maybe you want to 
hopefully I'm saying something noteworthy and you want to take some notes or, or maybe you want to listen back. All our sermons are, are, are online. You can listen back and, and sort of take some more time to just journey through what God's been saying to you. But also actually daily how you spend the time in God's word. You know, I don't know about you, but you're not going to have a healthy diet if all you ever do is on, on a Sunday, you have a massive dinner and you eat nothing for the rest of the week. I don't know about you, but I'm flagging by Sunday evening. <laughs> but you're flagging by Monday, you're flagging by Tuesday. By Wednesday, I'm like, Phew. don't do it with God's word either. Don't just come and get a great meal, hopefully on a Sunday, and then neglect God's word the rest of the week. How are you spending time with God's word daily? And there's some great things. Like I said, we have more access to God's word than in any generation before us. You've got on your phone, if you have a smartphone, literally go on, onto your app store, play store, Google store, whatever your store is, and type in Bible. And the first one that will come up, without a doubt, will be the YouVersion Bible app. Completely free, with thousands of different daily devotionals that you can do, and hundreds of different translations of the Bible. We've got no excuse. But not even now, I want to encourage you to get some good Bibles as well. I want to encourage you to get, get a study Bible. If you've not got a study Bible, don't know what a study Bible is, come and chat to me afterwards. But study Bibles are one of the things that transform my walk with God. Because I'm not just reading God's Word, but sometimes it doesn't make sense, does it? Just me? Just me? No. Surely not, right? We, 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 there's, there's times like, hey, what does that actually mean? And the great thing is, I don't have to try and make it up myself. There's other people, other scholars who've studied the Bible in a more in-depth way than I have that can help me learn. And I can then compare it with other people and sort of come to a place where, all right, I understand what this means now. I understand now how I can put that into practice. And so I want to encourage you, get some good study Bible. So I would recommend, personally, the two that I use the most is a life application Bible. That's great if you're just reading the Bible. It's going to ask you some challenging questions down the bottom as well. But get a life application Bible. But the other one that I use a lot is an ESV study Bible. They're sort of very different in their uses. So the application Bible is going to help the rubber hit the road in terms of putting it into practice. And the study Bible is going to give you the context, the history, more of what's been going on behind the passage. And using the two together, for me, is really helpful. But start to get some of these things in place. And if you want to go even deeper, then maybe there are some commentaries you want to get. And chat to me if you want to get some particular commentaries, because there's a lot of commentaries out there um, as well. But plan it. Not ad hoc. Not just open your Bible and wonder what God's saying to you today. There was once a, this is a really cheesy Christian joke, and it wasn't in my notes, but I'll tell you anyway. There was once a person who, who did that. They opened the Bible, and it said, Judas hung himself. Oh, they don't, don't like that, so they closed it. So they opened the Bible again and said, and they, the next verse they found was, go and do likewise. Um, <laughs> be intentional with reading the Word of God. Now, I'm not saying there, there's actually one particularly powerful moment in my life where that kind of did work for me. So there is some use in it. It's still God's word. But be intentional. Read for a book. Get a devotional, whatever it might be for you. And I'll, can I encourage you? Start small. If this is a new habit for you, make it manageable so you can achieve stuff. I mean, when I was first starting to read the Bible, I thought, oh, I'm going to read from Genesis to Revelation. Watch me. I got to Leviticus and I was struggling. <laughs> but why don't you go for a small book? Go and read Philemon. Go and read Jude. You've done, a, you've done one book in a day. But, but or, or go, 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 go and read a gospel. Go and read Mark's gospel, the shortest to the point. Go and read something that's manageable, that you can see results, you can start to see how ah, it's making a difference. And I, and, and I guarantee as we do that and we put it into practice, your appetite for God's word will start to grow. And it will make an incredible difference in your life. Second one, prayer and fasting. Not just prayer. Prayer is really important. We, we pray, we talk to God, we commune with God, we, we speak to God and he speaks to us. But in Matthew 6, verse 16 and 18, it says, when you fast. When. Not, not if, not maybe, not at some point when you fast, but when you fast. It, it's something that Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. When you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've, they've received their reward in full. 
But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to the Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, I would say there's two aspects to fasting. So firstly, there is the aspect where actually it's just a private thing between me and God. And there are times where we corporately do it together. And I want to uh, encourage us, there's going to be some moments without, throughout the year where I want to encourage us to corporately fast together. Um, it won't just be food, there'll be other ways of doing it because for some people, health-wise, that's not possible. But I don't know about you, but if the promise of God is that when I fast, the, my Father who sees what is unseen will, re, uh, what is, will reward what's done in secret, I want that reward from God. Now, I'm not doing it to get a reward from God. I'm doing it to seek his face. I'm, but I know I've seen in my life and I've seen in other people's life the breakthroughs that happen when we fast and we, we, we go to a new place. It doesn't, I don't quite understand it, but God tells us to do it. But when we do it, God does something. He speaks, his voice is more clear than I've ever known in the periods when I've fasted. So pray, yes. Let's be those who are praying daily, regularly, or continually praying into various areas of life. But let's also be those who fast. I want to give you a couple of resources in terms of prayer. I know for some of you this has been a massive difference. It's Lectio 365. Lectio 365 is from the... Um, the guys at 24-7 prayer, and it gives you a moment in the morning and the evening to, just to reflect and pray using scripture to meditate. But on top of that, if you, for those with children, Lectio for families, I think it's called, there's a family version, which is great. We've done it around the table with Judah, not as often as we like, but there's a memory verse, there's, there's scripture, there's prayer, and it's beautiful. And so I want to encourage you, let's be those who are intentional. Use resources that are out there. Maybe you've got better resources, carry on using them. But let's be those who are intentionally praying and regularly fasting. Third, another means of, of experiencing God's grace is the church. Hebrews 10, verse 24, 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, you could see this as me giving a massive plug to why I want you to do certain things for church. Please don't hear it like this. Hear it as, as your pastor, I want your best. And I believe your best is, is, will be found as you commit and are present in the body of Christ. When you're with the people of God, in the presence of God, pouring out the praises of God, serving God, being active in every single way you possibly can be. Now, that will look different for different people, right? But make it, like, if there's one habit for some of us that we need to get into um, this year, it's making sure Sunday is continually a priority. Now, for many of you, I know it's the case, but for some of us, we need to prioritize Sundays. Maybe some of us are actually stepping up and serving. Now, it's great, but we're part of Heart Church, we're a family, right? And as a family, we do stuff together. Uh, every morning, we have to empty the dishwasher. And uh, every morning we say to Judah, come on, help with the dishwasher. And Judah says, I don't want to. Fair play. And we say, but we're a family. But I don't want to. Yeah, but as a family, we do things together and we all contribute. And so Judah empties the dishwasher. Most days, unless there's days where we manage to negotiate some other way. Um, but we do it together because we all contribute. We're a family. Now, there's, obviously, we're not going to get him cleaning the toilet. He's not six yet. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but just say, but we, we all are part of the family. So I want to encourage you. We are a family. So how can we all get involved? And I'm so grateful for every single one of you that serve in some way or in the life of church. But maybe there's some of us who are like, actually, I've decided Heart Church is home. So how can I help make it home? So I want to encourage you. Also in terms of giving. I don't want to labor the point about giving because I actually think there's a probably a much better way of, in a fuller sermon to in, in talk about giving and generosity. But I, when I read the Bible, putting into practice the Bible means that we're going to give back to God from all that he's given to us. And so that's not just in terms of our time, but it is in terms of our, you could say, tithe, our, our giving, our financial giving. Now, I'm not going to stand here every Sunday and give you a massive lecture why you should give to church. I'm not going to do that. That's not the way we're going to do church. But I am going to encourage you for your best and let you know that God loves a cheerful giver. I want to let you know that everything that you have is from God. 
And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have 90% of what God's given me because I've given 10% of it back than try and keep 100% and try and do it on my own. Because I believe that when we give that 10% back to God, actually what we're saying is, God, I surrender it all to you. And so for some of us, go oh, 10%, whoa, fair play. Start with one, see what happens. Start with two, see what happens. I want to encourage you, let's be regular in our giving and our financial giving. Not just so you can keep the church ticking over. It's not because of that. It's actually as, it's a part of our worship. And our worship is say, God, you've given me everything. And because you've given me everything, I just want to give something back to you. And so I'll leave that with you. But, yeah, my heart for you is that you can experience God's best. And I believe you do that when we, we give back to God and surrender our finances to him too. So, church, there's so much more I could say on that one as well. It's, you can see how this could be a common sermon series. Four, and I can only say this, well, I, I, this is one that I believe is true, healthy living. And to be honest, I'll be honest with you, one of the reasons that I've uh, finally come to a place where I decided I need to do something about my gradual increase in weight is partly because of my own health and, and, and doing that for myself. But partly also because I don't believe that I can preach stuff like this well unless I'm modeling it to you. And so I'm making a decision this, this year to make a difference. Because actually I want to I wanna be, be healthier. And I, I want to not, not just preach the word, I want to practice the word. And so, because it says that we are in, in 1 Corinthians 3 that we are God's temple. Our body is a temple. And so that might look different for some of us. And please don't tell me, I'm not going to ask you all to, I'm not asking you to fast so you can lose weight. I'm asking you just to think about actually what's going into my body. Actually, maybe for some of us, it's to do with how much alcohol we consume. Now, I'm teetotal, I can really say that one. Um, maybe it's to do with smoking. Is our wise choice as a follower of Jesus? Now, for some of us, that's a lot less than what we used to be on, so don't hear any judgment here. But I want just, I'm asking some questions that I want you to think about. Maybe it's to do with eating habits. Maybe it's to do with exercise. And maybe actually for some of us, let's keep each other accountable this year and make a difference. You know, that's the reason why Slimming World and Weight Watchers and all those things work really well. Because every single week, someone's going to ask you, how much do you weigh? And so therefore, you're going to make it, it makes a difference. Because you're going to actually, you, you, you've, got, you've got some accountability there. Um, which we're going to look at in a moment as well, accountability. So I want to encourage you to think about, actually, are we living healthy lives? Are we honouring God with our bodies? Someone said to me this week, oh, but I just eat whatever I want because um, I've only, I only live once. And my response to that was, yeah, but I want to live for as long, when I, that one life I do have, I want to live for as long as possible, so I'm going to look after my body. Um, so that's my aim. <laughs> in a month's time, you might be saying, Dan, you lied to us. Um, I hope not. But if I follow my plan by the end of uh, November, I believe it is, it's a long time with Anna. Um, I'll be under 100 kilos for the first time since in, in over 20 years. No, not 20 years, surely not. No, I'd have been massive when I was a 10 year old. Uh, it, the first time in 13 years, I think it is. So we'll see what happens. But healthy living. Number five, sharing your faith. You experience God's grace as you share your faith. As you, exp- as, as you share the grace that you've received, you get to experience God's grace. And the reality is, how will they hear? If you don't share your faith, how will your friends, your family, your colleagues, how will our neighborhood, how will our town know about Jesus unless someone says, not on my watch, I'm going to share my faith. Now, we are not the only church in Morecambe in this area. We don't do this alone, but we do have a responsibility because we are in this area. And so we want to, as a church in Morecambe, make sure, like we, so our, our purpose statement, you could say, is we exist so the people of Morecambe and beyond are given repeated opportunities to see, hear, and respond to Jesus. That's why we're here, church. I want to help you build good foundations. I want to help you grow as a disciple. But if that doesn't overflow into us helping more people become disciples, we're doing something wrong. We want to be calling people to come to know Jesus. You are ultimately sat in a seat this morning, whether you know Jesus yet or not, because someone invited you or someone shared their faith with you. And I don't want to keep, I want the rest of these seats to be filled. I want to be forced to either think of new, think of planting more churches or, or get a bigger location because more people are coming to know Jesus. Don't you? Don't you? Like, that's like, we don't, we've not caught the heart of God if we don't realize it's not just for me. 
The heart of being blessed and, and receiving, the, the, uh, receiving salvation and being saved and, and capturing the heart of God, it, 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 it cannot just be about me. It's one of the dangers of maybe some of our Western Christianity about one-time decision, put your hand up, salvation kind of thing. Because it has to be corporate. It has to go wider. It cannot stay here. Even Jesus, when he, in, in, Acts, when he, um, in Acts 1 verse 8, that's not on the screen, but he says that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So that's where they were. But also in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. It has to go out. It has to spread. We can't keep this news to ourselves. If we keep it to ourselves, I would say we've maybe not understood it. Because <laughs> it's such good news that how could we keep it to ourselves? Paul writes in Romans 10, uh, verse 14 to 15, How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Please don't get your feet up. <laughs> Ultimately, we get to be those who bring good news to our world around us. Now, yeah, I want to encourage you to invite people to church. And I will preach my best sermon every single Sunday. And we pray, as we have done already, we'll see people saved. But there will be people that will enter the doors of this building that you will speak to, that I may never meet that you have the opportunity to share Jesus with. Please don't rely just on me. Do it yourself. You know, the, the Holy Spirit that's using me right now, same one in you. He's the same Holy Spirit that's living inside of you. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living in me and living in you. If he can raise Jesus from the dead, if he can make a donkey speak, I'm pretty sure he can use you. He's using a donkey. No, no. <laughs> He can use you. Some of you need to hear that this morning. God can use you. Number six, sharing in communion. Regularly sharing communion is, is actually something that... So I will set our theological stance on if you want as well as part of this. But this here is bread. This here is Ribena. I don't believe, and we don't believe as a movement, that anything changes to these elements in any way, shape, or form as you eat them. They remain Ribena, they remain bread from co-op this morning. But as you receive them, something can happen by God's grace as you internalize and remember the, what God has done. So nothing, I don't believe they change. Now some Christians believe they literally become the body and the blood of Jesus. Well, I'm not there. <laughs> But I do believe that as we remember, as we do as Christ instructed us to, as we remember his body and his blood, that by God's grace, he can do something. That people sometimes are healed, that people encounter freedom, that people have miracles happen as they receive communion. Not because of the elements, but because of what they're remembering, because of who they're coming to. So I want to encourage you, and actually, we weren't going to do communion this morning, but I couldn't get it out of my head that I can't preach about experiencing God's grace through communion and not give you an opportunity. At the end, we're not going to do communion in a fuller sense as we normally would, but at the end, during the worship, if you want to come forward, it's not going to be handed around. If you want to come forward and take a cup and take some bread as part of your response to God's word this morning, that's why it's there. But, that's, but I want to encourage you, because Jesus says in, in 1 Corinthians, when, and you'd have heard these words many times, because I use them so often. Like, I'll read the whole thing, actually. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he gave him thanks for it, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If we want to be a church, that when Jesus says something, we do it. And he said, do it in remembrance of him. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the, the, the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Number seven, being accountable. James 5 verse 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I spoke earlier about being accountable, this whole idea about losing weight. But how about, I'd rather not be accountable just about losing weight, but actually about how my walk with Jesus is going. 
And so I want to encourage you, are there people in your life that can ask you difficult questions? Are there people in your life that can ask you how, how you're doing in a certain area of your life, maybe that you struggle with in sin or whatever it might be? Now, they're difficult people sometimes to find, but I encourage you to search for them. Because I believe that you will be a better follower of Jesus when you're accountable to other people as well. Number eight, good works. You are not saved by good works, but you are saved for good works. Be the difference you want to see in the world. Our world needs some more people who are going to be light and salt and make a difference in the world around us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. For you are so for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are prepared. You are God's handiwork. Wow, right? You're his handiwork. But he's prepared in advance some good things for you to do. So let's do them. Let's, be, let's make the difference by doing good things and making a difference, doing good deeds. We should be, the church should not be known as a place that only does good deeds. But it should be a church that, uh, we should be known as a church that does good deeds. People should look at the church and go, they're good people. I don't, I'm not, they might go, oh, I don't agree with their message, but they're good guys. And we pray that they'll know that we're good guys and they believe our message. Yeah? Number nine, and finally... Be present with the la- be present and generous. I don't think it's on the slide, but be present and generous with the last, the lost, and the least. I'm going to read this, this whole passage. It's a bit of a lengthy passage, but because I want you to see God's heart for the last, the lost, and the least. This is Jesus talking in Matthew uh, 25, and this is talking about to, uh, the, um, talking about the end times as well. It says this in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in, in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I read the whole passage because I want you to see the depth of the heart of God for the last, the lost, and the least. Now, this is an area we probably need to work on in some respects as a church. But I, at the same time, there have been moments where, where some of the stuff we've done with CAP and other areas where we, we, we want to we show God's heart for these people. But we need to be present in the world around us. And in the community we're in right now, there is incredible amounts of need. And how can we make a difference? How can we be present? How can we clothe? How can we feed? How can we visit? How can we do these kinds of things? I don't know about you, but I know which way I want to go when, when, when Jesus comes, which side do I want to be found on? Not just because of that, but because we want to be those whose heart beats with God's heart. So there's nine things. Please don't see it as a to-do list and sort of beat yourself up about it, but I want to encourage you 
These are some ways in which you can, by God's grace, do these things and experience his grace. And these are some of the things that I, I hopefully I've shown you through scripture. You are putting into practice scripture when you do these things. And so as we come into land, I want to ask you the question, what are you going to do to ensure you have firm foundations this year? Maybe you need to ask the question, what are you going to start doing? And what are you going to stop doing? How are you going to surrender your life? Consecrate yourself, which means to set yourself apart for the purposes of God in 2023. How are you going to ensure that when the storms of life come, you have firm foundations? Because you're putting into practice the word of God. And so I'm going to leave a moment of quiet. And here's an opportunity for you to start to make decisions. Because changes make, start with a decision. Me making a decision that I want to be healthy this year started by me actually making a decision I'm going to do it. So I'm going to get an app that's going to help me calorie count. I'm going to buy some new scales. I'm going to buy a row machine. I'm going to do things that are going to help me achieve the, what I want to achieve. What are you going to do to enable you to do some of these things? What changes do you need to make in your life? And so I want to leave a moment of quiet and we want to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Maybe there's one or two things, maybe there's more, but maybe there's one or two things you're like, I know I need to do something like that this year. I want to encourage you to resolve and make a decision that by God's grace, with his help, this year will look different because I'm going to resolve to make, do something differently. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Thank you for what you've already been saying to each of us. Would you guide us now? Would you really bring to mind what it is, the practical step, the different thing we're going to do this week and next week and for the rest of this year? Because we want to be those who put your word into practice. Come Holy Spirit.